We ain't never gonna quit. We ain't never gonna quit it, boy. Nah, we ain't never gonna quit. Nah, 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 we ain't never gonna quit it. All right, welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander, and I am coming to you live today from California Elite Training Center. I gotta stop saying I'm coming at you live. I know this is recorded. We're gonna edit it. It's not live at all, but it makes me feel better to say that. So today I'm joined by uh, Bruce Orlando. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce Orlando. Okay. Yeah, I can't say that last name. <laughs> um, so, you know, your uh, is it fiance, Amanda? Yeah. So she reached out to me and she, we, she, we were talking about some of your story. And then I started talking to other pod, um, podcasters and, and influencers in the powerlifting world about your story. And I found it to be like really intriguing. I think it's interesting how we all sort of find our outlet within fitness, strength, endurance, whatever that is. Um, but it always means something different to that person because there's some path that sort of got us there. So I know you played Division One football growing up. Uh, yeah, I played at San Diego State. Yeah, I played at San Diego State. Okay, so um, I kind of want to talk about your path a little bit. In, in your bio, like one of the very first things it says is like you, you went through an injury and then it sort of like looked like you went through this process of refinding yourself. And yeah. um, So I kind of want to talk about like what – what was it? How did you grow up in the fitness lifestyle? And then kind of what got you to this point? Yeah. Well, actually growing up, the funny thing was, like, I wasn't um, healthy at all. You know, uh, Puerto Rican grandparents, pretty much they look at you and you're always skinny. Yeah. No matter, I was 300-pound, 12-year-old. They look at me and they still thought I was skinny. So, you know, growing up, like, that was always the, the thing for me. Like, I was eating unhealthy, but, you know, I remember, like, my best friends that, moved, uh, that lived across the street, always wanted to play basketball. They always were in the front of the house, like, asked for you to come out. Yeah. And I think that kind of, like, set it off. And then I started playing sports. Like, I love playing sports. I was always, like, kind of like that big athletic guy. So it was just, like, something intriguing to me with that. And then mm-hmm. football came around. I, I moved to, uh, originally for Stockton, moved to San Jose, went to Oak Grove High School, um, played football there. Was doing really well. You know, obviously, when you first came, like, First kid, like, I was not in shape at all, wasn't yeah. strong at all, but I always had I always had a tough, you know, really good work ethic, even when I was younger, because my freshman year in Demon Play, like, I was a scrub, okay. to be out front like that, and that was the one thing that I hated, so that offseason, I worked my ass off, and I made it to varsity my sophomore year, as a kid that didn't play his freshman year. Okay. You know, so that was one of my things, like, I was always geared like that, you know, my dad really pushed me. You know, to always work hard and stuff, and then so high school started going around. Then I hurt my I hurt my back before my junior season, so I got real fat. <laughs> all right. So that was rough growing, and then lost all the weight. Everything was great. Like my senior year, my senior year was like looking really promising, and then I tore my knee, uh, tore my MCL one week out of the first game of your senior year of high senior school. Year. So um, I still played the whole season, but I don't wear a knee brace and. I was a big defensive player guy. Like, that was my thing. And I had to play more offense than defense okay. because of my limited range of motion laterally. Okay. Know? So that happened. Didn't get the D1 scholarships out of high school. Well, it's like a you death know. sentence for college if you get oh, hurt your done. high school senior year. It was done. Like, I, rem- I won't forget. Like, And then, like, I lost all the weight, too. So I remember Stanford came to practice, and, you know, I was out there, and they looked at me like I was, like, like, <laughs> like what happened to you right you know so all those things like, I never forgot and uh, went through the JUCO route uh, ended up finishing my JUCO career at City College San Francisco okay and that was one that was before that I went to De Anza and De Anza was I would say like three tiers you know the A League the B League the C League yeah De Anza was the C League you know um, a lot of times it wasn't that far away from home I didn't want to like move all the way to the uh, San, Jose, San Jose to San Francisco I didn't want to do that yet so I went through that. Didn't have a great year, and I looked myself in the mirror. I was like, "Well, if I want to, if I want to play in the NFL, if I want to play D1 football, I should play the best junior college possible." Sure. San Francisco is like, you know, top three, top top number one in the nation for junior college football. Yeah. You know, literally that year that I decided to go, we went to the national championship game. Okay. So it was like those things where I already had like a lot of negativity from there. There was just like, "Oh, you didn't do this, like." You think you'll be able to play it from a C league and A league? You're just miraculously gonna get better. Yeah. You know, I stuck it out. I had ten sacks that year. Um, 
Still didn't get that many looks. What, what were, you, were you, like a DN? Or? I was a defensive end. Okay. Yeah. Still didn't get that many looks, and, you know, I thought I was going to, like, be balling with 10 sacks. I was like, oh, yeah. Then later, that I didn't, so I didn't get any scholarships. During the spring, I was just working at, like, uh, GNC. Right. So I was in the store just trying to stay healthy. And then the summer came around, and I got a call from San Diego State. Okay. So then that's how it all steered there. Got there, came in out of shape. My one chance, my one shot blew it. You know, because then when I did get back into shape. Oh, you showed up not ready. It's not ready. Shape. Okay. Not at all. Uh, and then, so they registered me. Yeah. And when you're a JUCO transfer, you're expected to play then. Right. Right. So I come back the following year. Best shape I was ever in my life. You know, I shredded down. I was like 250, you know, 15% body fat. So this was like my high, right before my deep low. Okay. So this, I'm thinking like, oh, you get yourself this, ready. Right? Yep. I was told you I was a defensive end. Yeah. They moved me to nose guard. All right. You know, and I still had lateral movement issues, you know, and that was the biggest thing where I'll have two, three guys on me at once and I couldn't really move that well. Defensive end, like, contained. Crash the whole like those assignments were so I was really used to yeah playing nose guard I wasn't yeah so that really threw me off and then um, so you never know, surgically fixed your knee uh, no just let it heal okay okay you know and then like I said with my back problems and stuff like that that's when they started reemerging a little bit yeah I never forget I had to take Viking in ibuprofen and pre workout before every practice. <laughs> I would have to. There's the only way I would get through it. Okay. Many, if I didn't do that, I'll have a shitty practice. Yeah. All right. You know, and this is like one of my last chances. Like I needed to give everything. And, yeah. You know, I feel like I feel like obviously like many backups do. Like I thought I was better than the players that were playing in front of me. Sure. You know, but you know it is what it is. I never got my shot again, and I was things like I never expected to. So like, once you get one shot, you get one shot. That's all you're ever guaranteed. Right. I feel like if I would have got a second one, I feel like I would have made something of it. But it is what it is. Then they put me on medical, and then this sort of starts going down. Um, so I'm on medical scholarship. I got super depressed. You know, um, my great grandfather passed away, and that really shot. That really shook home for me. Yeah. I was raised by my grandparents, so I was telling you. Okay. So for me, that really that really hurt. So I just hit a huge depression. And during this time, I went like within six months, I went to 270 pounds, 30 percent body fat. I legitimately lost 50 pounds of muscle mass Damn. and put 70 pounds of fat within like six months. Okay. All I, because I, growing up, I would never drink or smoke, never do drugs, none of that stuff, but, because it was all for football. Yeah. Once I thought football was over, I started drinking, smoking, eating whatever I wanted, like, you know, that was the only thing, then that's when it, I really hit rock bottom. Yeah. Then, during that time, my, I met uh, one of my mentors who's like, like pretty much changed my life. Siasi hmm. uh, Viamo, he's the owner of Ramona Fitness. He, that's where I actually started doing personal training. I went to him to help save my life. Really? Oh yeah, You're I was super depressed. low. I was super low. Like, yeah, you know, I'll show you my before pictures. You wouldn't even believe it's me. Really? Yeah, it's real bad. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, make sure you see that. And then uh, that's when I started because football was all I had in my life. Well, like a lot, a lot of football players, that, especially if they make it that far to Division One. All they're thinking is NFL, mostly, you know? Yeah, of course. Life after football, you really don't think about that, you know, until it's like life after football, you know? Yeah. And for me, I needed to find something I was so passionate about that it would equal to football or right. even more. And for me, it was to help people. And that was probably my biggest thing was like, I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference in the world. Sure. You know, I want to be able to look myself in the mirror and know that I helped somebody today. Sure. So that's why I started doing personal training. But before I can do that, I needed to help myself. Yeah. So I went through my, one of my biggest lows during that process. You know, uh, I had my infamous rock video where I'm barely able to pick it up. Tears coming down my face, you know, screaming like, you know, I'm a failure, this and that. I'm on my knees, like... Even if I was like, you know, choke up a little bit now because I think about that like it's just yesterday. Yeah. You know, and it's just like so, so low. Yeah. You know, and for me to be able to like pick myself up and then things like a lot of people see like who I am today. Yeah. Outside perception, they have no idea how far I've come. They look at me as some, as if like I'm like my goals that I'm doing now or what my achievements are unattainable. Mm. It's like, you know, like I'm almost been, like I've been sixth place. 
You know, and like, Jeez. my squad went up like tremendously during this whole thing, and deadlifts too. It's just like, they look at that, like, oh, that's unattainable. Right. Like, that's like, oh my God, this and that. It's like, you have no idea where I was five years ago. So I think that's why it's so important to tell your story here, right? Because how I guarantee so many people listening to this, they see the people that we have on the show, and they're typically, if, they, if they're on a podcast, they probably did something worth talking about. And so we compare where we're at now to where they are now, and, and there seems like such a disconnect that we Im- immediately disassociate ourselves from ever being able to do that thing. And it's like, as I'm listening to your story, if you could draw it out on a graph and you were to just plot it, like you are, your back is against the wall like six or seven times throughout this. It's like you got these highs where it's like, hey, got in shape, got showed up, and then, you know, go to junior college, didn't work out. It's like, Jesus, man. Well, like, we're, me, I always thought like, it was like every other year, you know, I'll never forget about, oh, this is the year I make my bounce back. Yeah. And got to that point, and then it'll be the time like, oh, shit, this is the year where I fall down. Yeah, know, it's like, like, can it ever just be steady growth? Yeah, but yeah. it's not how life is. Yeah. And I think it's worth, that worth pointing out because so many people in life are like, they're they're in that roller coaster. It's up and it's down, and they're trying to figure out what if, if it's just them. And it's important to point out that it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. So we get to this point now where we're we're super low. Yeah. Um, during this time, like you know, it's like this is what's so surreal. Like I promise you, I wake up every morning. Like I worked out three days a week for like three months. How are we like powerlifting or? No, I was just doing fitness stuff. Okay. You know, I was just doing. Uh, six in the morning. I'll get to the gym at six in the morning. Do cardio. Okay. With a cardio class, and I promise you, this ain't your twenty-four hour fitness. Hop on the stairmaster kind of cardio. This is pick up boulders, flip tires, run down a run down a trail where you can barely see. Yeah. You know, it was some rough shit. You know, was, and I think that's what built my toughness. Yeah. You know, the name of the gym itself, raw mana. You know, mana means spirit. So that was the thing is to bring your inner mana, bring your inner raw spirit out, mm. you know, to showcase like your toughness. I think that's where I really got my toughness from. Okay. You know, was was that. So I have the 6 a.m. cardio. Just brutal conditioning. Brutal conditioning, just dying. Then 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I do my own lifting. Just high repetitions. Like nothing what I'm doing nowadays. Like even my form was then I was just, just lift weights. Yeah, just like learning. Yeah. And then I'll do the cardio again at night. And the cardio again at night, I was actually just doing dancing. Uh, you know, Polynesian dancing, so that's the... Oh, damn. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tahitian, Tahitian dancing. Okay. Where do you yeah. live? Where are you living? Here? Right now, I live in North Park. No, but I mean during this process in during your life. During this process, shit. Um, there was a, so this is like another kicker. It's like, uh, I was actually homeless. Oh. Yeah. Fuck. It's like, uh, a lot of people don't know all this stuff. Like, that's the... Like, people have no idea, like, where I've come from. Yeah. Because... Like I told you, when I told you my grandparents passed, like, they were my financial support. And, like, with scholarship, everything was paid for for me. Sure. And I didn't want to call back to my mom or dad, so I never called and asked for help. I uh, stayed in my car, especially put friends' houses. And then I had a really close friend that her and her husband let me stay at their living room floor. Damn. And I stayed there until I was able to, like, bounce back. Fuck. You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, right. like, uh... You know, during that time, man, I, that's why it was easy for me to get up 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I, wanted to get, I needed to get the fuck out of the house. Yeah. I needed to do so. Right. You know, and uh, during this time, like, I was, the biggest thing is, especially now that it's so surreal, I'm like, like, this Friday, I'm, I'm going to Iron Addicts for the Summer Bash. You know, C.T. Fletcher holds it yep. every year, you know. Yep. And it's so surreal now, like, to be a part of that versus five years ago, I was watching his motivational videos. Damn. Religiously. Really? Every morning. It's four, it's four or five o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. I just, you know, I worked out three times a day before. Did cardio until like eight or nine. And then I go to sleep and then wake right back up. Mm. All I did was eat and breathe this stuff, you know. Yeah. So, uh, during that time, like, yeah, I watched CT Fletcher videos every morning. So, I want to definitely, obviously, continue through the story. But, like, I just want to sort of, like, pause script yeah. for a minute. So, for people that are listening to this... Like, I don't want the the profundity of this to be lost because it's like you're watching this fucking guy on TV. Yeah. We're five years later now, and this is a dude's a part of your life, right? Yeah. And there are with this guy now. What do you attribute from homeless watching this fucking guy to, to where you are now? That's a good question. Um, honestly, it's just like everything why I've been preaching in all my posts and what I've been saying, like, you know, never give up. Like, sticking to it. Sticking to it. Just believing, sticking. Push forward, sticking. Push forward, like... 
I, I had I always had a high confidence in myself. Yeah, even, even when you were low. low. Okay. Because I knew what I knew what my capability was. Yeah. It's just that at that point I choose I chose not to believe in myself. I chose to not try because I know I can be successful. Yeah. That's the thing where it's like uh, I think one of the, one of the, like Gary Vee says so many good things. Yeah. But one of the biggest things that I got from him, he loves to self destruct, and. You know, just so he can rise from the ashes again like a phoenix. That was probably the one of the, one of the things out of many that struck home to me because I'm really good at self, self-sabotage in my life. Yeah. So I can bounce back. You see how many times I fell back just to bounce back. I wanted to say that. Listening to your story, I'm like, yeah. it sounds like you're oh, almost, you need your back against the wall to thrive. Yes. In a lot of cases. Yeah. So it's just like, and I've done it so many times where it's like, once my back is against the wall, I'm comfortable. Yeah, this so is I life. I won't fail. Right. I can't fail. Right. I'm out of there. <laughs> yeah. So I would say yeah. like, the biggest thing during those times was during a time where it's hard to believe in yourself, that you got to realize no one, no one's going to believe in you. Like no one will. Yeah. Like, especially if you don't believe in yourself. Right. So if you're, if you're no one in the scene where people don't know you in that sense. Yeah. Uh, and you want to be a part of that. At that time, I didn't even think about that stuff. I just wanted to, like, help and, like, live life. Like, yeah. I didn't care about, you know, where I'm at today. Like, that wasn't my end goal. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. But I think the biggest thing was, you know, finding your why. Yeah. You know, my why was, you know, my family, my brothers. Like, those, those were my why. It's my why is to get up every morning. Yeah. You know, because I, I, would, I would run scenarios in my head, like, man, well, what if I just end my life now? Yeah. You know, and I would just think, the things that always stopped me was like my mom, my dad, how much they love me and stuff. But the thing that always struck home to me were my brothers. Mm. You know, I wouldn't want them to live life without me. Yeah. You know, like I care so much for what they think about me. So for them to like, that my last action is something of a coward, you know? Mm. And that's the thing too, is like when people talk bad about that stuff, it's just like, it's easy outside in, Outside looking in to 100%. be like, oh, you're a coward, you're this, you're that, like, you're soft, like this, like, you, you don't have the mental thoughts that the other person is going through. Right, you have no idea. Obviously, looking back now, like, why was I like that? Yeah, of course. You know, but at the time, I just know that at the time, your thoughts are a lot different than when you're, like, in a good, in a good place, you know? Yeah, when you're in it, you're stuck inside your own oh, head. And, and then you, depending on who you are, I was, I wanted more of that. Right. I want more depression. I want all of it on me. Yeah. You know? So it was just like, I would say that would probably be the biggest thing is like, if you if you have your back against the wall, you know, find your why. Yeah. Find your why that will get your ass up every fucking morning at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know, and grind until the, you know I mean, until midnight and be able to do it all over again. Sure. You know. So, so, all right. So now at this, this kind of point in the story where essentially homeless sort of where yeah. we can get in where we can fit in yeah and we're watching ct fletcher in the morning you're going to these conditioning classes three days a week you're you're working out oh every day every day oh every day. every day okay three times a day that was, that was the thing it was every day three times what, a day. what was your so i guess at the same time you're running these scenarios of like what would it be like if i weren't to be on this earth anymore right like what would it be like if i took my own life and then at the same time there's some part of you that's like getting up at 6 a.m. and go and like there's something there's some reason you're pushing forward. Yeah. Did you have this idea of the life you wanted to build or did you just know forward progress will breed something? I just knew that this isn't how it's going to end. Yeah, this is how my story ends. No, like this is not it. Yeah. Like, it can't be. Fuck it. Because growing up, <laughs> like it's the funny thing, like how I'm doing now, it's like I've always been like that. I wanted to make it to the NFL to show that shit, you can make it. You can make it, like, yeah. Anyway, like, you can make it. Like, look at what I went through. Mm-hmm. That was my biggest thing, what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I wanted to prove people that they were able to do it. Yeah. And at the bottom of my heart, I still feel like I could have and can still make it. Yeah. Reason being is because I just know I didn't have my shot. Not everyone gets the shot they need. Right. And the exposure. There's people in the league that all the time that aren't necessarily the best players that they've ever been on their team in high school or in college. Yeah. Right, right situation, right time. Like, you know? And for me, it was just like I wanted to have that to show people. To like be an example of what's exactly. possible, right? You know, all my prior football stuff going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're not going to play this. You're not going to do that. I wanted to make it just for that. Yeah. You know, because I know there's a lot of kids out there that, you know, are grinding during the summers and, you know, coaches are saying this and that and, you know, they want to give up. I want to show them that, you know, they don't have to do that. Yeah. You know, they can keep, if they keep pushing, they believe in themselves, they, they can make it. You know, mm. that was my biggest thing. Yeah. You know, so it's funny now, like, 
I'm still doing that in just a different sense. Yeah. You know? It's interesting that you just knew intrinsically forward progress will, will get me somewhere, right? And that's, that's kind of the thing with a lot of people when they get down, I think it's like, they don't necessarily know what direction to move, but they're almost paralyzed and it's like, just move forward. You'll figure out what you want, what you don't want through forward progress. So I guess at that, if you guys are listening to this, if you're hearing stuff in the background, we're like, there's people lifting right behind us. <laughs> it's kind of perfect actually. Um, but so I guess we'll, let's go back to this moment where you're, where you're going through all this stuff. Like where's your path go from there? Um, let's see. I was losing the weight. Yeah. I was back. Then I started refining myself, and you know, now I became a personal trainer. Okay. And that, that's this is where the story gets good, because during this time, I remember like I was seeing everybody. I remember I was a shell of myself during the time. Mm-hmm. You know, where like uh, you know people were like lifting weights, and like I'm just looking at these guys like, like all oh, y'all ain't shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I remember I'll never forget this. I remember I brought in uh, one of my one of my best friends today. You know, one of my best friends. He's like a brother to me. Play football with him at San Diego State. I thought he was a personal trainer, Chris Gordon. Okay. I, you know, I brought him in. I was like, hey, come, come work on me over here, blah, blah, blah. And then ever since then, man, we just stayed connected. You know, like, throughout that process, man, I, I promise you this. He was, him, so the two biggest people, you know I'm saying, like, Siasi and Chris. Those were the two biggest things, because Siasi got me up, right? Mm-hmm. Got me walking again. Chris got me running. That was the biggest thing. All right. You know, like, because I had the mental toughness and stuff like that. Now, Chris, what he did, he put, you know, I mean, he had something to build with now. Yeah, and gave so it a direction. Me, exactly. During that time, too, he believed in me. When I told him what I wanted to do, I told him I still wanted to play football. He trained me. You know, I still feel like if certain things didn't go wrong, like, I still would make it. Yeah. I was, again, ready to go for an arena football trial. I got, like, a personal trial. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to make it. All I needed to get is some film. I had no film. Yeah. I never played it now. You know, Chris trained me hard and, you know, it got me ready. Fucking the, the AFL went under. Oh. The year it went under was the year that it was supposed to be my trial year. Damn. So I was just like, okay, I was like, oh, what's next? And then, you know, during this whole time, I was powerlifting. Yeah. I got to be competitive something. I sure. got to do something. Oh, you're like competing right. in powerlifting. Yeah, yeah, I did a couple. I did think one meet or like I did a, a mock meet or some shit. I was like, I was still lifting. I was still doing training. So. Yeah. And then... Uh, you know, then I started like some just I started. Then I started doing powerlifting, like started doing a couple meets more, and then you know I still had that itch. You know I had that itch, and uh, I missed football a lot, and so I went rugby. Rugby is my family sport. Mm. My dad was amazing growing up. My uncles, my cousins, you know, amazing. Yeah. Played for like you know you know uh, Samoa played for New Zealand. I got a cousin that played for uh, Team USA. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, the family in sport is, is rugby. All right. So I was like, I think I could do this. Yeah. You know, I went from 290 down to 258. Damn. I was running kind of like, when I lock into what I want to do, I just, I'm like all in. Full force. So, like, every other day I run three miles and um, still do, like, still do my regular training and then Chris would throw a wad after my training for me. Okay. Because rugby, you got rugby, you got to be everything. You gotta be strong as an ox, but you gotta have some conditioning. Yeah. Cardiovascular is the biggest thing. So yep. that was the biggest thing that I really pushed for. So I started doing that and Damn, um, you were running three miles every other day? Every other day, yeah. My big ass was <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, look at me now, you're like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but I mean yeah, I'll never forget the best shape I ever was in my life. Okay. And I felt great, you know. Playing rugby and you know, I was just I was I was green. I was green a little bit. I was a, I was a great athlete out there, you know making tackles, like, you know, running the rock and stuff like that. Yeah. But, and I, it made me miss football more. Hmm. I think that was the thing. I was looking for something to replace it, and that made me miss it more. Because remember I told you earlier, you know, in the interview, I was telling you, like, I was weak laterally. Yeah. It exposed me in rugby, so I had to do something about it. Right. I did something about it. I became I became better. Yeah. You know, and my conditioning was great. Like, all this stuff was great. I so like, then you're seeing your athleticism. Yeah. You're like, fuck, I want to put this where I love. Yeah. Yeah, so then it made it hard. And, you know, I remember it was like winter break. Uh, like I said, I was, all, I was still doing all the training and stuff. Uh, Gracie held the bench press charity event. You know, Gracie B. Troops. Okay. Yeah. Showed something for that. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. 
Right behind me, I'm still playing rugby, still doing all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, jumped in and I hit 500 pounds on bench press for the first time. Okay. First time ever. <laughs> you know, and it hit me. I was like, I was like, man, I should go all in on this. Yeah. Like, if I'm hitting 500 pounds, not not necessarily not trying, but powerlifting wasn't my focus. Yeah, but, but if you're running course. three miles every other day and you're benching 500, like. You know. Yeah, so I was like, fuck. I was like, I should go all in on this. And then that's when I made my decision going all in powerlifting. Okay. And I was like, Chris, I, this is something I want to really do. So yeah. Chris started directing me. Like I said, Chris has directed me throughout the way. He's never pushed me. I think that's the one that he always knew that I would be a, you know, a really good powerlifter. Mm -hmm. But he never pushed me any direction. Never pulled me in any direction. He just guided wherever I wanted to go. And that's like the one thing I couldn't ask for a better friend. Yeah. Like he did, he did, he believed in me. Whatever I want to do, he believed in me because he knew what I was capable of, you know. And I think that's one of the biggest things was because he didn't push me into the sport, that I just naturally like found it. Found it, and that's why I'm like really in it now, you know. Yeah. And you know, I owe it all to him, you know, because then during that time I started really getting into powerlifting, and then this is where it gets interesting too, because uh, during this whole time, Chris uh, and my buddy Gino met a uh, big boy at a powerlifting meet. That's when they linked up. Straight started, cartel. Straight cartel. Okay. This is, where, this is the very beginning. This is before straight cartel even came. About, they met. Okay. At this point, big boy was still with five percenters. Uh, they met, because um, Gino actually uh, owned Simply G Mills. That's when Simply G Mills first started. The meal program coming out in San Diego. Okay. Um, and wanted to sponsor big boy. So then they started connection. Then they started talking and then you know, Big Boy came out and started Straight Cartel with Pitbull. Um, when that happened, they brought on they brought on Gino. You know, then later on they brought on Chris. I was the only one out of my little uh, my friends that wasn't on the team. Yeah. Not one. I, obviously, I didn't care. I just knew that I had, I had to earn it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I never expected anything. You know? Yeah, just for being there. You know, and which is huge. Yeah, which is important. That's one of the things. Like a lot of people be like, they like they'll ask for things or they'll be like this. Not once. Have I asked to be on the team? Yeah. Never. Out of the two, three years prior to me being on the team today, I've never asked to be a part of the team. My number one goal was to get to a point where they couldn't ignore me anymore. Yeah. You know. Which is the best advice for anybody. Yeah, and just like I said, like, and then I'll never, I never forget the day. I got, I got a text from Big Boy, or a call from Big Boy saying, "Hey, do you have some time? Like, come to the gym later today." Yeah. And the gym is. Uh, Motivate Performance Center up in uh, Full Hill Ranch, okay. Orange County area. So uh, that's something I need to plan. Like I got a call. I was like, I'm gonna do this, you know. And then Chris, Chris was gonna go too. He told me to come. And then I remember I was walking up there, and then he pulled me to the back to the warehouse because uh, Motivate Performance Center is also the the founding of um, or the main base of uh, I'm forgetting now, Nutrition Zone. Okay. So, right, right. you know, go, go back to us that way, and then, uh, then I'll never forget it. He's like, he's just like, Bruce, welcome to the team. And I'll never forget that day. Fuck. You know, because I literally came back that night. Because remember, I had to plan everything. I yeah. I came in the morning. During that midday, I just went out there just to see him and, you know, for him to tell me that. You know, and then I came back, and then something clicked. You know, I worked out that, that, at like 9 or 10 o'clock that night. Because I had to get ready for my meet. Yeah. Couldn't miss any workouts. Not only now representing myself, my family, I also got strength cartel in the back of my yeah. like, like, as you can tell, like, you know, like, we have the little phrase, like, you know, strength cartel most hated, you know, all eyes on us. Yeah. You know, and me being the new guy, oh, yeah. Well, let, let the questions, let the commit, you know, questions start coming up. How, how he make the team, all this, this, and that. Like, those are all the things going on my head. Yeah. And I just wanted to keep pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward, and just keep getting better. Yeah. Because you know, not only that, and during this whole time, like, Chris had my back. You know, he told him, like, you know, that, that he should put me on the team once he asked for Chris's opinion. Yeah. You know? And, you know, all these, like, all these guys, man, like, they're like family to me. You know? Yeah. So it was, it was like probably a big moment in my life when I finally got Hell yeah. the invite to be part of Strength Cartel. Because it was finally like that aha moment. Yeah. Where I tell you all like trying to make it here and trying to make it there and never really making it anywhere. Right. You know, I always was really close. Yeah. You know, something happened where it gets swiped up. And right. And me making a Strength Cartel honestly felt like I finally made it. Yeah. You know. I think it's interesting because it's like you have this moment where you finally make it. 
and you still have all these sort of doubts and questions that you're putting in your mind, it's like you're manufacturing a oh, way yeah. to keep your back against the wall, so you got to keep pushing, and I think that's, that's just interesting. Yeah. So you, so then you get picked up, you're part of the strength cartel. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was, yeah. <laughs> that was tight. I was so happy. Yeah. You know, like I said, I think it was just like, it was funny, I'll never forget this part. <laughs> I remember it, because another thing I never did besides not asking for our team, I never put a strength cartel on my bio. Because I didn't want the outward per, you know, perception for me to seem like I'm trying to yeah, yeah. be a part of, like, say that I'm a part of it. I wore all the clothes, I tagged all that stuff, but the bio, I didn't want to seem like I was already a part of them. Yeah. And that was probably the happiest day. I'll never forget what I put, you know what I mean? Yeah. Drink our child here for hitters. Yeah. <laughs> Purple coat, Bruce Ted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, like, yeah. So many people, I really believe, they want some kind of sponsorship just to say they're a sponsored oh, athlete yeah. in their bio, right? Like, they want to just say, like, whatever athlete Bro, like, use they'll, code. They'll use ambassadorship. Yeah. They'll say they're a sponsored athlete. Yeah. But yeah. if you're not getting paid and when you're just getting some discounted clothes, they're right. not even getting free clothes. Yeah, yeah. Like, bro, you're, that's not it. Right. That is not it. But right. just for the clout, they're going to be like, oh, I'm sponsored, this, this, and that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was never about that. Right. You know? And so now it's, I one of the things you put in your bio, which I was like, holy shit, he's putting it out there, was this idea that you want, like, the biggest bench in the world. Oh, yeah. Um, that was just like I wanted. I wanted to. I wanted to chase something. Yeah. And bench press has always been my niche since, especially since my, I had a back issue. I couldn't really squat. Right. You know, it's funny. I think like squats. So I would say bench press shows my talents. Okay. You know, deadlift shows my heart, but squats, you know, reveals my character. Yeah. Interesting. I definitely put it. I put all those three lifts just like that. Yeah. You know, because deadlift shows my heart, like, I ain't gonna quit. I'll pull until I can't pull anymore. Squat, I mean, bench, like, that's my shit. Like, I mean, I'm rep shit out, heavyweight, all that. Squat, though, it shows, like, how really, how tough I really am because my back issues, my knee issues, you know, I can't, I, here's the thing with my squat. I can't put myself in the optimal position as someone with amazing mobility can. Right. I have terrible ankle mobility, so sometimes a fixated point what should be on my legs is more on my knees because my ankle mobility can't flex that well. <clears throat> right. So that's the thing. Tight hips can't really get that deep. So when I try to, like, tight back, you know, bad back compression on the way. There's so many variables that yeah. go against me. You know, I just remember, like, here's a really good story. It's like, when I started squatting, like, started training again, i never forget this day. I'm, like, at 24-hour fitness, I'm still big. Like, at this time, I'm, like, benching over three, 400 pounds still. Yeah. Right? And I'm at 24-hour fitness back squatting. I'm doing sets with 185, like struggling though. Whoa! You know, I'm looking right, you know, right next to me, right. And this is a little Asian cat that's like doing the same weight or a little bit more than me. Right. You know, but not once did I, you know, I was like, oh, let me add more weight. Let me do this. I follow the program. I trusted Chris. Yeah. And I just knew that one day, like, my, I'm so relentless. I was like, one day my squat's gonna go up. Yeah. I'm too big, too strong. There's no way. Yeah. You know, and I was like that pot, like that confident and. I think this past year is when I finally broke through that plateau. Uh, Chris got me ready for the U.S. Open, and I squatted 744 in competition. Damn, from 185 in training. 185, like struggling. You're right. Five, like maybe 265 max. Yeah. Within like maybe five years or so. Damn. Yeah. I don't even know like how many people they want to skip that work. They want to skip that process. So oh, they so do. get straight to the right. Point. That's yeah. why the quarter squat gang is the thing on Instagram, oh, right? Hey, bro, it's funny. He's always funny. <laughs> yeah, funny. But I think that's the thing, right? Like people, they they don't want to do the reps at 185. Yeah. They want to get to the the big weight, so they yeah. they skip the work. Yeah. I like that each lift sort of has a intrinsic meaning to you. Yeah. It's like you know, bench is where I showcase what I can do, and the squats where you showcase your character. When I was talking to a few different people about getting ready to do this show that are in the powerlifting community, and we were talking about it a little bit pre-show, but one of the things I brought up was this uh, this video where you like deadlift and then cry or something like that. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah. Yeah. So everyone saw that wondered why I cry when I work out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's. Um, Cause, and here's the thing, it's like, I don't want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't do it for Instagram. Right. Like, if y'all, if, if Instagram was really popping back then, you would see me crying with 85 on my back. Right. Like, I promise you that. Like, I've always been that guy. Like, I told you, like, me picking up that rock. Yeah. And, like, I was in my tears because I was hurt. So, and then I wanted to do anything not to be like that. So, when I'm squatting 
weight that I physically can't do, and I have to like really, sh you know, showcase my character and my heart how bad I want to do something. You know, that's when I start thinking of all. I start all thinking about the, the, my past, my dark past. You know, I start thinking about my grandparents passing. Mm -hmm. You know, that still, you know, shit still chokes me up to this to the day. You know? Right. Um, I think about all the times I failed. Uh, I think about like, you know, my family. I never forget the time where my mom told me when my grandma would pass. And my grandma raised me. My grandma was like my mom. Mm. Like, she was like, amazing, like, loved me so much, told me I could be anything I ever wanted. I had so much great positivity growing up. You know, that's why, I, I think that's what stands for me thinking that I can do anything. Yeah. Is because growing up, I could do no wrong. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I was like, I was, I mean, I was a, the promised child, whatever you call it. Like, she loved me. You right. Know? And loved me so much that it made me love myself. Yeah. You know, so wow. when my grand, when my mom came, it was down in Mission Beach. We're at Wave House, I think. Yeah. We're sitting on those chairs where you can walk by. We're sitting on the top of those chairs. My mom comes to me. I had something was wrong. She called me. Yeah. Like, whenever she called me, I'm like, oh, shit, something happened. She called me and she told me she passed away. And that hurt. That hurt a lot, you know, because that was like, that was like my mom. Like, she loved me so much. And, like, you know, I felt... Here's the thing that I, inter I internalize so much. Yeah. So I'll bring, I'll, I'll come back to that. I remember my mom, like, just going, crying hysterically later, going to the beach. Like, going into water and just, like, I like we're fully clothed, like, regular clothes. Yeah. Clothes in the water and beach and, like, you know, it's just, like, on the sand. Right. Just, like, covered in sand. Tears coming down her face. And I felt hopeless again. Damn. That was top three toughest moments. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it. To see my mom like that. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. Right. You know? just... It's like, I couldn't even feel bad my grandma. I'm like, you know, let's see my mom. But like, mind you, there's, we're in you know, Mission Beach, yeah, San Diego, California. People there everywhere. It's summertime. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I was summertime. There's a hell of people out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? They've seen all this. You know, and like, I was just heartbroken. So, during these times, you know, um, I'll say I, I internalize all this, all this pain, like, because I'm like, if I would have made it, if I would have made it to the NFL, my grandparents wouldn't have, I wouldn't have to move to Puerto Rico. Mm. My grandparents didn't move to Puerto Rico. My grandfather would never fell and eventually pass because of that. Mm. If my grandma didn't feel alone, you know, maybe she wouldn't have taken all those pills. Right. You know, so it's just like all these things. I'm like, I blame it on myself. Of course. You know, so during this whole time, so now that you have the not painted the picture, yeah. now I'm squatting. I think of all this stuff that I just told you about, right? Yeah. Now what I'm thinking is if I get this rep, everything will be okay again. Yeah. It'll all disappear. Everyone comes back. I literally trick my mind into that. I have to. Yeah. That's why you see tears coming out of my face. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm like really letting loose. And during this whole time, I'm talking to Chris. You know, he's been there like the whole time. You know, helping me out, like just let me be me, and you know, he can say one or two things, and I'm like in my zone, ready to go. You know, because he knows when it's like, like he calls it a like a fake scream or a fake roar when I'm really trying to hype myself up. Sometimes it doesn't click. Yeah, I mean, she just gets hard. I'm so, like, and then he knows when I turn it on. You know, and then that's it's funny. He calls it like like my superpower. You know, it cracks me up. You know, because he's like, he's like, I do shit that that people really don't do. Struggle with one rep, get fucking pissed off, tears coming out of your face, and then bang out three or five more. Right. You know? And I think that's one of the things, like, how how it started coming around, was the tears coming down, because it was my therapy. Yeah. You know, like, during those things, I never talked about anything about it. Like, this might be the third or fourth time I've ever talked about it in general. Yeah. So it's like, nothing that I'm like that, let's say, open about, but I'm definitely, like, close to my chest about. Sure. You know, so... Yeah. I want to be like, I put on my captions a little bit, but a lot, you know, I mean, my Instagram ain't popping like that where everyone's going to know why I cry. Right. You know what right. I mean? So they, all they see is the crying video. Right. And like we talked about, the internet's just ruthless, so oh, shit will right. just get Ooh. out there. <laughs> I'll never forget this. So, oh man, I got the most hate. I'll never forget the most hate I ever got. Really? So I came, I flew out to the Bay. It's, uh, it's the anniversary of my great grandfather's passing. You know, once again, I'm seeing my mom. I'm seeing my brother. I'm the only one not not crying at this point mm. at the dinner table. You know, you know, we had a special dinner and stuff like that. We were just there, all yeah. the family. You know, later that that next morning, I flew out. 
I only came for one day, just for that. Okay. And the next morning I flew out, and then I had a squat. Right? I was going for like a big PR or something. I was going for like 550 for a double or something. Or, yeah, double or triple, something like that. I think it was a double. And, you know, I'm like getting hyped up. I'm like in my zone, you know, and it's probably this is probably the one where it's just like tears going down my face. I fucking struggled. Hit the bottom, probably RP 1 million. Yeah. <laughs> started shaking at the top. I started falling back. I gathered myself, didn't rack it. I'll, I'll die before I rack a bar. Yeah. You know, and I went, fuck it, I almost, almost died. Yeah, <laughs> right. I went down for the second rep, man, and boy, did I get so much hate on Instagram. That was probably the most hated video I've ever received. But why? Oh, because they're looking at my technique like, oh, like, you're doing this for, like, you know, people say, like, you're just doing this for attention, like, oh. this, this, and that. And mind you, these are some, like, some people, like, I I, I, ch- I mean, I, I don't forget. I remember some people that talk shit. Yeah. Like, if I ever see you in public, you're like, bro, you don't know where I'm from. Yeah. So it's just, like, try to keep stuff personal and professional at the same time. Sure. But at the same time, it's, like, don't expect to talk shit on Instagram. And then you see me in person, and we're going to be good. Well, it's, uh, you know, I said it before, but nothing makes a small dog feel stronger than a big fence. And the internet is the biggest fucking fence imaginable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's super easy for these uh, key yeah. back, keyboard warriors. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, damn. And you know what it is? I think it's what makes your story so powerful in this this whole idea is, is the rep isn't about the rep, right? The rep is about it means so much everything that got you to that rep. Yeah. It means if I get this rep, my grandparents come back. I yeah. Get this rep, like my mom's happy. I get to be able to get the house. My dad doesn't have to work as hard. My brother doesn't have to be without a brother. You know. Yeah. Like he's in San Jose, and I can't be there for him growing up. Like that hurts. Right. Because I, mean, I grew up with my other brother, like my youngest brother Noah. Like I, I can't. That shit hurts. I can't be there for him. Sure. You know, because I have to be out here living my life. I'm not ready to go back home. I got nothing to come back home with. Right. Uh, that's my mentality. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Like, it's, it hurts me that I can't be there. You I know? get that. And yeah. I, I, I internalize all that thinking, like, if I would make the league, everything would have been fine. Right. You know? Right. But, I mean, it, it's, we're humans, right? So it's yeah. easy to, you, of course, you want to, like... Logically, I know I'm completely wrong. Right, right. <laughs> but you just want to make sense of the world but somehow. But it's, it's like, you know, obviously you can say, well, the what if. Yeah. Right? Not necessarily that I'm wrong. What if I did do that? Yeah. There's a chance that everything could be fine. Yeah. I'm gonna believe what I want to believe. It pushes me harder. So, logically, I know it's not healthy sometimes, but at the same time, I know it's the reason why I do what I do. Yeah. So. What are your um, your lift numbers right now? Um, competition, seven. squat is 744. Bench is 578. Okay. Deadlift in competition is 650. Now the deadlift has been like. Up and down, like I just recently got carpal tunnel. Okay. So that that shit sucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, during the U.S. Open prep, I got fat. Honestly, I got huge. All right. I went from like two ninety three three hundred around there to three seventy. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> right now, like you see me, I'm around probably around three forty ish right now. Okay. Yeah, you know, I want to get down to like three twenty. You know, stay healthy weight. Cause my ultimate goal is like you know I said chase the bench. Yeah. I can't be two fifty doing that. So I know I gotta be bigger, but I didn't have to be that big. Yeah. I was just you know my coach said get as big as you can. My squat kept going up. So I did it. <laughs> Word. You know, and it was great. Yeah. You know? And I was just down in the back, but because of that, I couldn't get in my position with deadlift. My tummy was in the way. Damn. <laughs> so I had to keep widening my stance. And yeah. The wider my stance, the wider my hands go. The wider my hands go, the less better grip I got. Yeah. Like, my best deadlift pull ever is 725. Oh, damn. You see the disparity? Yeah, there? yeah. So I was just like, right now I'm training, uh, I'm doing bench only me coming up in November, and I'm peaking my deadlift with it. Okay. So I'm looking to pull something, you know, mid sevens at least. Okay. You know, yeah. Just, just so, just to myself, to prove myself that I can like death or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, so what? Um, where, where for these sort of ultimate goals? Do you know where your bench will have to get? Uh, say that one more time. For your ultimate goal, do you know where your bench would have to get? For what would you need your bench press to be? Um, for to the have the highest bench in the world. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, right now the record is uh, seven thirty eight. Okay. Uh, by Crow. All right. But my boy Julius Maddox, though, he's a monster. He's an irregular strength on Instagram. All right. Uh, he's been 705 in competition. He's actually competing this weekend at Boston Bosses. 
Yeah. So it might be 738, but after this weekend, it might be a lot higher. Damn. Like, he is a monster. You know, and I, I got a chance to meet him uh, at the American Food Expo in Houston uh, this past year. And it was great to, to meet somebody like that and so humble. You yeah. Know what I mean? Like, it, he helped me with my bench press a little bit, give me some cues. And I really feel like he helped me with, like, especially with my leg drive. Yeah. You know, but. After this weekend, that 738 might be gone. Really? Yeah. So Damn. Wherever it is, that's what I'm chasing. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I got to believe that all of your story, the things that you're doing, I know you do a lot of training. You do online training. You do personal training. Do you, <clears throat> is it just about the, the, the metrics and the numbers with you or do you sort of help your clients get at this bigger purpose behind the lifts? And Oh man, like everything I just told you and how I experienced myself. What I went through with my first mentor, yeah, that's my heart of training. Yeah, I tell them there's a reason why you come to me and not to 24. You know, uh, I have clients that, and here's the thing: is like patience is the key as a trainer. Yeah, right. I can work with the one thing that's hard for me to work with somebody is somebody that does, that doesn't want to put in effort. Like if you don't want to give, that's the people I can't train. Yeah, I can't train people that don't want to train. No, like, I mean, yeah, like, nobody can. Yeah, <laughs> right, away. right. Yeah, but you gotta want. I can better. train someone that's mentally weak because they're mentally weak for a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, once I find the reason, I can showcase something else. You know, I have one of my clients, man, probably one of the, one of the best mental transformations ever. You know, Candace. She uh, when we started, she <laughs> she she it was a blind consultation. You right. know, someone referred her to me, and then she came in and. Uh, never forget it. She told me after the consultation, she's like, if I knew who you were, I would have never came. Really? She's intimidated with all this stuff. Sure, yeah, yeah. Very intimidated, you know? Um, so, I started training her, and then she, I remember, I think it was the first one where I was like finishing on some abs, and she felt like she couldn't finish. I didn't get upset. I don't expect her to know that she's able to push through something she's never felt that before. Okay. You know? Of course. For me, oh yeah, I felt this pain before. I know I can push through it. I've done it countless of times. Yeah. Her never has felt it. How would how would so how would anyone expect to be able to do something if they never if they never experienced something to begin with? Yeah, I don't know, but I think there's a lot of trainers that aren't conscious of that. Oh, I'm huge on that because I've been there. Right. So the first thing I told her, I was like, "Hey, don't worry. I don't expect you to, you know, feel like you're able to do this. I know what you're capable of. The problem is you don't you don't know what you're capable." Of. Right. I was like, we'll leave this today and then we'll come back. And then the next workout, usually you guys talk off the stairs. The first thing I figured to do was finish your workout from the last one. Oh, workout. damn. First thing I did, then I forget. I was like, hey, we got to finish this ass. And I told her, I was like, it's the small things. It's the attention to detail that's going to make a difference in your life. That's dope. You know, she made an amazing transformation. I think she lost like 30, 40 pounds, you know, um, barely able to squat to, I got her into a powerlifting competition. Holy the same shit. person that was afraid to walk in this place would never have met me, yeah. competed, like one of her biggest fears was like doing something like that in front of a lot of people. Mind you, she owns a, she owns a business. You know, she owns a Pacific Beach Nutrition. Okay. You know, something in store down Pacific Beach. And that was probably one of my, one of, one of many of my proudest like coaching moments. Yeah. Because the strength part, that shit's easy. And I honestly like, it's one plus one. It's right. like it's like more like you know numbers. Right. You train them a certain way, they're always going to get stronger. By how much difference, right? Of course. But they should get stronger. Of course. It's to be able to make the life changes. You know, she's a different. Like she'll tell you herself now. She's like she's a completely different person than she was a year, two years ago. Mm. You know, I think that's probably one of my proudest transformations. Not only body transformation, but like you know spiritual transformation. Yeah. That's why I really. That's why I feel like I excel as a trainer. You know, I was like, I'm not the best trainer. Like, I don't, I don't think I know everything. Like X's and O's, the technicality. You know, like, I'm sure. a trainer. You know, I, I pick Chris's brain off like every day. I ask him, hey, why do you do this? Why did we do this today? What do you think about this? Yeah, yeah. I do this all the time <laughs> for the last five years. That's yeah. how I became such a great trainer because what Chris has taught me. So obviously, I know that I don't know everything. Yeah. But the thing is, the way I beat everybody out here, I care more than any trainer will ever care about their trainer. Their, their clients. Yeah, it's the shit that matters. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anybody like you, anybody can learn the X's and the O's. Exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? But but you gotta you gotta differentiate. I mean you gotta cater to the human aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. Is there anything? I think this story is actually going to be really beneficial for a lot of people that are struggling. <laughs> is there anything that we haven't mentioned today that, that you want to talk about or mention? Um. Well, 
besides my own brand and stuff, like it's funny when I found out what the podcast was called, like Lionheart Radio. You yeah, know, I was starting my own brand, like uh, Lionheart. Okay. You know, Lionheart Strong. You know, all my all my clients are part of the Pride. You know, right. I got a little oh, nice. like only the strong survive. Yeah. You know, so yeah, all those little things that I'm, I'm branching off myself, like it's nothing major. It's just like my own brand. Like, just want to create something where you know the belief of uh, how much heart really means. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm really trying to get across out there. That's badass. So, yeah. so why did you go? Um, like, obviously, I have my reasons for Lionheart Radio, whatever. What? Yeah. Why did you? Why did you go with the Lionheart? Yeah, I'll never forget it. Because I've been thinking, I was like sitting down, and I was just like, I was with a couple buddies, you know, and I was thinking, I was like, I'll never forget my, my boy Andrew. He was, uh, he was sitting down, and we were just like, like bouncing things off each other. Like we didn't know. I didn't know what I was going to call my grand. Yeah. You know, and then he said Lionheart, and I was like, I like that. You know, for some reason, it just it just, clicked. Stuck, it just clicked because I wanted something that embraced the entirety of who I am. Sure. My strength, my heart. And I think Lionheart itself is exactly that. And during that time, too, I had long hair, so it looked like I had a mane. So yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, I mean, I really believed it, you know? Yeah. You know, I, like I said, I got a lion tatted on my, on my chest. On your you heart. Know? Yeah. yeah. Lionheart. Like, I really believe, like, how much heart has to in, uh, in takes for lifting or in life in general yeah you know like that's probably one of the biggest things that i feel like i want my name and brand to stand for is something like that yeah you know for someone to look at my videos and because my end goal for everything too is just like i want to be able to be on stage and be a motivational speaker yeah you know and i know I, the, the best thing that chris told me was like he's like god is doing this on purpose how can you be the best motivational trainer if you never have trials and tribulations? Yeah, you can't. He's like, enjoy. The, he's like, don't ever forget this. He's like, enjoy the hard times now. Yeah. Embrace it because these are going to be the things that when you speak to somebody, you can make a difference in their lives. Yeah. So when Chris told me that, like, all this stuff, the private stuff, I know I'm not going to be lifted forever. I want to be able to tell my story and everything that I've been through and bring up. That's that's the only reason why I want a big platform. Yeah. That's the only reason why I want a big following. So I want to reach out to more people. Every time I hear somebody commit a suicide, it, I feel like a failure once again. Yeah. You know, I'm like, fuck, I'm like, I wish I, I was able, I wish, I wish they were able to see my story. I wish I was able to do this and that. I see it all the time, man, and it's just like, it breaks my heart. So it's just one thing that motivates me and pushes me is to make sure I can at least try. If I can make it, if I can, if I can commit one less person to commit suicide, I feel like I've done something. Yeah, fuck yeah. You know, so, so that's the reason why I like my heart. Yeah, you know, that's badass. Yeah. I, I think just looking back at your whole theme and your story, I really like that you're you're all in, like on everything. Every rep, oh, yeah. every the lifestyle, oh, yeah. every fucking move, like it all matters. Nothing is insignificant and you're all in. I fucking think that's a, something that people can really, really benefit from. So the, the final question, the Lionheart kicker, we ask every guest this. If you were given a platform for the day and it were guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear what you would say, be translated to every language, what would you tell people? The biggest thing was you can never lose if you never give up. You know, you might not be winning at the time. Yeah. You know, like I told you all my stories of how I came through, you know, and how I made it to, you know, Division One football, how I made it to strength or to, you know, shit, how I made it to this podcast. Yeah. You know, a year ago, man, I, like I said, like I don't, like, I wouldn't expect stuff like this. Yeah. You know, but the biggest thing during this whole time is I never gave up. So there's no way I can lose. That's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so like I, I'm just keep on winning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like that. It it reminds me of um, this sort of quote, but it's like they say the greatest quarterbacks, like in the NFL, they don't ever lose; they just run out of time, right? Because eventually they win. Because the kind of people that never quit, that never stop, they always figure out a way yeah. to get where they need to go. And I think. The fact that you're getting ready to go train with the people that you looked up to five years ago oh, yeah. says all you need to know. Really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, yeah, man. Thank you for having uh, me. For people that are listening to this and they want to follow along with you and your journey, what, or maybe even training, whatever, where's the best place for them to do that? Uh, i got my Instagram, Mr. Underscore Orlando. Okay. Um, I have my, uh, my website, uh, lionheartstrong.com and bodybybruce.me. Um, get ready to branch off on a YouTube channel as well just to put more motivational stuff I have some lifting stuff but um, there's going to be more motivational stuff okay. uh, that I'm going to put out content wise Okay. and um, if you know follow Strength Cartel um, the rest of my boys see me and everybody else and what we do on our day to day basis 
and you know you can check out Big Boy's uh, Big SC Boy at uh, on YouTube. Yeah. To check out more videos, that's where all our strength cartel videos get posted. So. Okay. You know. Dope. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,